Welcome, everybody. This is Edgardo Valentine. And this is Scott DiGregorio. And welcome to the Real Estate of Tomorrow podcast, where we're going to discuss the rapidly changing landscape of the real estate industry and the steps that you need to take today in order to survive tomorrow. Look, I'm going to give you the perspective of a 25-year veteran, somebody who has been there and done that. Which is a slime for all part, okay? That's <laughs> for you, man. <laughs> Look, I'm going to give you a fresh perspective from somebody that's applying those steps today. So that basically means you're young and you don't know shit. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's get this started. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Real Estate of Tomorrow podcast. Dude, what's going on, man? It's been a while. I know, man. So um, listen, man, That's let's just jump right in. Yeah, okay? We got a lot to talk about. We have a lot to talk about. So look, the podcast is called The Real Estate of Tomorrow. And uh, the truth of the matter is a lot of the things that we have been talking about, you know, between you and I, just, you know, everything accelerated. Everything happened a lot quicker yeah. because of last year. So basically what we want to do today is we just want to talk about kind of like what the trends are for 2021. 2020 was definitely a different year than any other year. And uh, I think the trends are going to be different. Everything, everything, it's uh, it's very interesting in the real estate world. So where do you want to start? Look, I think, um, I mean, first off, obviously you're 100% correct. No, 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 that one's mine. Don't drink my, don't drink my bourbon, man. That's messed right, up. Right. The biggest shift is something that I came across a couple weeks ago, which is Zillow. And uh, you and I on the podcast and for years leading up to the podcast have talked about the, uh, the threat that Zillow poses to the realtor industry. And this is the biggest move yet. So Zillow is now rebranding themselves from Zillow Group to Zillow Homes. And they are bringing themselves under the umbrella of a national brokerage. Let's break that down a little bit because Zillow started something with the iBuyers before. Um, they did some moves when it came to mortgages. So it's it's a normal transition. It's not something that should take anybody by surprise. Why is this move so different than them doing the iBuyers or, the, or, or everything they have been doing, honestly, for the past, I don't know, Two, three years, four years? Sure. So, and, you know, it's it's interesting. I was talking to um, to an agent about this, and her response was, this is an agent I respect tremendously. Um, her response was, it's going to be interesting to see who wins this. But the answer to your question, Ed, is this. It's very simple to me. The um, In the public's mind, Zillow is the MLS, right? People think, in fact, countless agents have uh, – have gotten calls from people saying, I want to see this house. And the agent says that house isn't on the market. And the client says, I'm on Zillow. I'm looking at it. And the agent says, that's not accurate. And more and more agents are realizing that the client hangs up assuming that Zillow's wrong. I'm sorry, Zillow's right. And the agent's wrong. And the agent's pushback through this whole thing very accurately has been, yeah, but it's not the MLS. Yeah, but it's not accurate. And why this move is huge is because Zillow is now going to have an IDX feed. And for those of you that don't know, you're new in the business or what have you, an IDX feed is the mechanism in which you could stream the MLS directly to your website or whatnot. And for the regular consumers that are just, um, you know, just listening to this because they're interested in entering into real estate, the MLS is what the realtors put together or that basically the Zillow for real estate. I know the yeah, realtors a, are going to hate yeah, yeah. that description. And we just lost half our audience. <laughs> Thank you. But no, it, 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 it is. is. And, and for years, the realtor industry has understandably tried to protect that data. And, you know, the big misconception with this, a lot of people think, uh, you know, they sold out to these websites. And the truth is this, they were sued by the Department of Justice, and they lost, and they were forced to distribute the data. Now, who, they, who was sued? Um, National Association of Realtors. Not Zillow. No, no, no. Yeah, NAR was sued. They were forced to stream this data. Now, we should do a whole episode on whether or not they actually sold out by selling Realtor.com. And we that's... will. I think we should do a whole episode on Zillow because yeah. it's very, very interesting what they were doing with the iBuyers and all that. I mean, it was my understanding that last year at some point they were or they did open a brokerage in Vegas. Uh, Vegas or Washington out west, Vegas, Washington State, somewhere out there. That's what I mean. This is a normal transition to what they have been doing. And look, uh, what you say, it's very correct where, or, you know, what you were laughing about, which is who's going to win. 
one of the things that uh, that realtors were saying before and that we were, we frankly, we were all saying, it's about this estimate. And there's an ongoing joke or how off these estimates are. But we did last year, I mean, you did it with your closings. I did. A very interesting, why don't you talk about that since they were yours? So I've been following this thing for years. And what I keep telling everybody, and this is what a lot of people don't understand, the Zillow, unlike the MLS, is a perpetual database. What I mean by that is on the MLS, a home gets listed, a home gets sold. That transaction then falls off of the MLS's data. Like it's there, but it's not being factored into everything. Zillow is constantly compiling this data and using it to make their estimates more and more accurate. So what I did last year was- The other thing that's interesting about Zillow, sorry to interrupt, is that it allows the owner to also play with the value of their home in the sense of, okay, I did renovations and I did this. And that interaction also helps the AI. Of course it does. And look, you know, I think I've said this in previous uh, episodes. I know I've said it on stage a bunch of times. Um, Zillow spends 260 some odd million dollars a year on technology, a quarter of a billion dollars with a B that wins long term. So the reason why this move is so well, well, let me go back to this estimate thing before I forget. So what I did last year was I had my, my team pull, I forget the number, I didn't 13, I think it was, uh, homes. And I said, Hey, do me a favor, pull these deals, pull the appraisals, runs estimates on all of them and let me know. And, uh, there were a couple of larger deals, um, three quarters of a million dollars and up, that they the, were off. The, the gap was off. There was, there was no question about that. All in told, they were off nine percent. If you took those couple of large deals out of it, it was off something like one point six percent. So they are getting better and better and better. So the thing that hey, you could ignore these estimates, which by the way, in some cases they're wildly incorrect, and I realize that, but that's not the point. The point is, what is it today versus three years ago? Exactly. And what is it going to be three years from now versus today? And that's the thing that people aren't focused on. So the Zestimus thing is the first thing. That was the first argument. Well, that is going away. It's, it's, it's that, that gap right. is shrinking every day. And the next argument was, that's ah, not the real MLS. And that argument is in the process of completely disappearing. So what's going to happen is, and, and we're going to do a whole episode on this, if the real if the the realtor industry genuinely doesn't control the data anymore and the MLS loses its value what does that turn into and we don't know we you know we talked about the MLS lawsuit that's out there and and you know for those of you like you said that are maybe looking to get into the business the MLS is the mechanism in which commission uh splitting and and the money is all managed and policed so it's a pivotal part in things and this is a big move. And look, I think I think with all of this, the democratization of things, and this is what this is, is the democratization of the MLS. What you need to start thinking is what value do I bring to the consumer? What value do I bring to the table? Because gone are the days or gone will be for sure the days where finding the house for the client was the main reason why a client would use you. Because for what I understand, back in the day, it was virtually impossible to do it without a realtor. Absolutely. Lately, realtors are less and less being the ones that actually show the house to the client for the first time. They find it online. And I would argue that that's, that number is just going to keep decreasing. So anyways, this is going to be super interesting to talk about Zillow and do a whole thing. I'm also very interested to see how... Some realtors are combating this. Mm -hmm. And if this is going to be a real war between Zillow and the real estate industry, or if how some realtors are really going to start using Zillow in a different way, it's going to be very, very interesting how this is going to play out. It is. And another thing that Zillow has done, I, I want to make a couple of points and then I want to move on to the next topic. But, you know, you said a bunch of times that, that this is the natural progression of things and it's true, but there's one caveat. When Zillow started, they were there to help support and bolster the agent's careers. And now they're turning on them is how some people think. So that's important to know. The other thing regarding realtors not helping people find their homes, let me ask you if you're listening. Five years ago, how many how many buyers called you up and said, hey, I found 123 Main Street and I'm interested in seeing it. Can you help me? Versus today, what percentage of your buyers are calling up? Because Agent after agent after agent is saying that that is not because that is gone from being non-existent 
to being an exception to now being the norm. And that is the power of things. So like you said, if you're using that value prop and there's too many people train, quote unquote, trainers in the real estate industry, still teaching agents those scripts. If that's your value prop, you're in trouble. You need to, you need to add more things to its services and stuff, which again, we'll talk about in future episodes. So lot, lot to, uh, lot to go on, but I see this as the biggest game changer, the biggest potential shifter in the real estate industry that we've seen for years. And it's going to be interesting to follow it as really? it progresses. That big, huh? Huge. That's going to be, that's going to be very interesting to see how it plays out. Another thing that I'm interested to see is how quickly the adoption of this will happen. How quickly the realtors are going to make the move, how quickly Zillow is going to make the move. It's, um, it's going to be an interesting year as far it's going as to be that. Interesting. And I think some people will do well with it. And, and shift and, and do their thing. And I think others will get swallowed up. As everything, right? As everything else. With everything else. Okay. The second thing I want to touch on, and uh, look, we, we do have to to do a, a, an episode on this and not just on this particular one, but just on the larger uh, topic, which is Zoom, right? Video, Zoom meetings. Video I mean, meetings. Video meetings. Everything. Look, what happened last year was the, I'm going to try this word. Sorry, English is my third language. Humble brag. <laughs> the digitalization. Yes, the digitalization. The digitalization of the way we communicate. Yes. Now, this has been happening for a long time. This has been happening for millennials, for example, which are very, very comfortable with uh, Zoom meetings and things like that for the most part. But there has always been uh, a pushback from a lot of people uh, as far as doing things online and doing video meetings and things like that. And because of 2020, everything was forced, sure. I dare to say, forced into having to comply to this new world that we're in. Uh, I believe, and, and I shouldn't be throwing facts if I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that Zoom was the stock, uh, the Yahoo stock of the year last year. Over Tesla, which was was interesting. Firmly disagree with Yeah, that. well, me too. But, you know, that's because we didn't invest in Zoom, or I didn't, at least. Um, but my point being, look, uh, if you're not comfortable in, in any industry, really, but especially as a realtor or anybody that's selling anything, really, with video meetings, with Zoom, with all of these technologies, uh, that's that's a big problem. It is a big problem. And, you know, what what remains to be seen is... When we're past this state of fear, how many people continue to live in a virtual meeting environment? And my thought is a pretty good number of things. And, and, and you know, I got to tell you, even you and I, you and I had talked about we want to bring Zoom into, into our business. We want to make video meetings more, uh, a bigger part of things. And, uh, you know, the 25 plus year age difference between us comes into this, but There was a piece of me that was genuinely concerned. Am I going to be able to build rapport? This is a face-to-face business. A lot of those adages that were drilled into my brain over the decades I've been doing this and what I've learned, and again, I was forced to learn this, is that most of that's in my head. Now, there there are still now, there was last year, and there will always be a segment of the population that wants to come in, shake hands, look in the eyes in person, cool. But- more and more people are going, you know, I think working from home permanently works. You know, I think Zoom meetings work. Yeah. And and in your defense, it's a lot of it had to do to not just with the way you felt about Zoom or about video meetings or about any of these things, but also almost like the stinking hat where now I feel like we're all, we all have the excuse that everybody has tried it. And uh, I think for the most part, the people I talk to, they're very comfortable doing it. And um, we have found ways to almost be able to communicate and, and create that report better. Like one thing that I absolutely love about the Zoom meetings is how easily I can show people my screen. Yes. And I know that's something that's super silly, but I feel like when they're in front of the computer at their home or in their office or whatever, and my screen takes their whole view, they're more focused on what I'm showing them that when they're in the office, when they're in the office, I feel like they could be a little bit more distracted. That's something that I love about it. Um, so, so that's cool. And the other thing is it allows me now because people are more in tune with technology. It allows me now to uh, show them all the tools that we have. And I feel like everybody's just a little bit more um, 
familiar with all of this. I agree with that. Now, you know, all of this being said, you and I have had to figure out some best practices. Yes. I've been uh, on Zoom meetings where other people were conducting them, where they were done poorly. So when we do our episode about this, we need to break down and we're going to break down what are some best practices? What are some things to stay away from like it's the plague? Um, we could probably change that to stay away from like it's COVID. Like it's COVID. Is it, there is it too, is it too yeah. soon? I don't uh, know. Zoom meetings 101 versus Zoom classes, Zoom seminars. Yes. Yeah, it's there, there's there's a lot there. And and the other piece of it is, and, and you touched on this with showing the screen and, and showing the tools. How do we adapt our client presentations, yes. a buyer's presentation, a listing presentation in this format? How do you follow up with them? What, what, do, you, what do you send to them afterwards? Um, how do you ask if they're comfortable with, it, with, with a, a, a video meeting? Like all of these things, because it could be done well. And, and I would say it can make our business better, but man, it could get screwed up too. But let me tell you something. It's one of those things that, one, you want to start trying immediately because now is the time to do it because now it's the norm. So before it stops being the norm, because it might never stop being the norm, now is the time to do it. And number two, man, for somebody that's newer in the business, or for somebody that may be uh, it's a little better with technology, what an advantage that gives you today versus the old ways of doing business. Because now you are competing with those people that now – you know, they can't meet with clients face to face. So this gives you this gives you a great advantage if you actually apply yourself and do all those things that we're talking about. So we'll do a video on that. We'll do a, a video. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do a, a whole episode on that. And same thing. We'll see best practices and uh, we'll look for examples of who's killing it in real estate for this. One question that everybody needs to ask themselves is this. If you're not doing it, how many transactions are you losing? I, I, I mean, I remember when, when we launched our digital application platform, um, which is amazing, there was pushback, right? You and I were cutting edge on board. There, there is still pushback. There's still pushback. With some of our peers. And uh, some people said, you don't understand. I work with an older clientele. They're not comfortable with technology. And, uh, you know, what's been interesting was I did a loan not that long ago for somebody who was 73, if my memory is correct. And he told me, if you guys don't have a uh, digital application and a secure digital portal to upload documents, I won't do business with you because I don't like meeting people in person. I don't like carrying around my documents. And I'm sure as hell not emailing my documents because of identity theft. So this was a stereotypical, you know, like face-to-face type of person, at least in some people's mind. Right. And the truth is, if you don't have a digital application, you lose that deal. So if you don't have the ability to do Zoom meetings... How many transactions are you losing solely for that reason? Well, speaking of losing transactions, another topic that's going to be really, really hot, in my opinion, is virtual showings. Yes. If you're a listing agent and you're not doing virtual showings, I don't know how you survive 2020. It's it's really true. And, and you know, th- there's a lot to this. Um, you know, think about it from the seller standpoint. So maybe the seller, you know, look, everybody's, everybody's a tough thing to say, but so many people's view of health and safety is probably permanently altered. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So how many sellers in the future really don't like the idea of all these different agents tramps and all these different people through the house? I mean, there's, there's always been security concerns. Um, now there's potential health concerns, whether they're real or not is irrelevant, right? Fear is fear. So, how many sellers would consider that advantageous to make the house available for virtual showings? And if you're a buyer's agent, uh, you know, especially here in Florida, when you're dealing with clients all over the country, how easy is it to do a good virtual showing and secure the deal in what used to be called sight unseen, but it's still seen. I mean, the Matterport cameras were a big step in that direction, but you know, you and I have talked about this in previous episodes. It's a matter of time before somebody could log into their computer and just walk around houses and look at them. And uh, although that technology is not perfect yet, it's getting there. We are already at the point that agents are walking around with a phone on FaceTime or Zoom or whatever app they're using. And uh, you're a hundred percent right. It's, I don't consider it an option anymore. I consider it a necessity. 
And I consider it a hindrance if you don't don't offer that service. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think you touch on everything. Uh, it's it's a necessity right now. It's one of those things where the technology is not going to slow down. It's not going to revert. This is only going to get better. And and just from a practical standpoint, think of the reach that you can get when you are actually offer this service as opposed to, look, you can only come to my house on this particular Sunday from one to three. Right. I'm sorry, but the world we live in, that's completely against everything we're doing. Yes. Everything we're doing in our day-to-day is making things easier, making, make, making things more accessible, more available on my time. Open houses go completely against that. I'm not against open houses. We probably do a video on and, uh, and a honestly, whole episode on open houses. Well right now because everything of, works. Right. We have that. Yeah, thing. we laugh about that Everything works. If you do it right, everything works. But my point is, you can do both. And turning your back to virtual showings makes absolutely no sense. Not in this year, at least. I think we need, you know, I think everybody needs to have a focus on putting as many tools in the tool belt, tool belt as possible and knowing when to pull out the right tool and how to leverage that tool to its greatest uh, capabilities. And that's what we're going to break down when we talk about virtual showings. Yeah, we would, we would love to talk about that now, and, and probably bring somebody that's, that's doing great in so. virtual yeah. showings. I, think, I mean, I, I think bringing in some guests on some of these topics is, is definitely the right thing to do. Now, the next topic that is on the mind of every buyer, seller, and real estate professional in America right now is low inventory. Low inventory. That's I think that's going to be the theme of 2021. That has been the theme of 2021. I mean, we've seen some crazy statistics about low inventory, honestly, across the board as far as the price range, right? And look, the interesting thing with low inventory is not just the fact that there's low inventory, but how that affects the market, how that affects prices, interest rates, affordability. So everything is really getting hit because of the lack of inventory. Absolutely. Not to mention how to put in an offer, yes. how to increase your odds of getting offers accepted. You know, do you include a cover letter with a nice little story with the, with the offer? Yes. I mean, the problem that, you know, and this is the whole premise of the podcast, but the problem is there are people teaching real estate agents to conduct their business the same way today as they taught them 10, 20, and 30 years ago. And I'm sorry, real estate, real estate is a living and breeding thing that the market changes the way that you should approach everything. Like you're saying, an offer, the way that you set up a listing, all of these things will be affected depending on the market you're in. I would argue that two years ago, the real estate was completely different than it is today as far as putting offers and all that. Of course it and is. even in different markets, it affects things differently too. Look, you and I are both training new loan officers. We don't have to train them on how to take a good application anymore. No. What we have to do is get them a domain and connect their application link to it. That's right. I no longer have to teach my team how to do income analysis. Right. Because I have an app for that now where I feed 600 pages of tax returns in, and an hour later, it spits out a figure for me. There are th- These were fundamental pride points. Like as a loan officer, I take a good, thorough application. I can analyze tax returns to the ninth degree. You don't even need those anymore. And like you said, I'm not talking from 10 years ago. I'm talking from two years ago, three years ago. Like this is new. So, uh, and by the way, not only is it new to us, it is what people expect. I ask people all the time, listen, would you like me to take the information over the phone? You want me to send you a link? I I can't say everybody says send me a link, but- it's surprising to me when somebody gives a different answer. Right. So everything has to shift. And if you're not thinking about how things are changing, you're going to get left behind. And by the way, if you're newer in the industry or you're thinking about getting in the industry, here's your chance to crush some of the people that have been around forever and are resistant to change. Because you will now, although you might not have the experience, although you might not have all the answers, you might be conducting your business in a way that aligns with people's needs, expectations, and wants. And a lot of times, many times, it's all it takes. Right. So the inventory thing is is big, and we gotta we gotta break that down. And like you said, it's you know, and we'll get into the into the you know when we do the podcast episode on it. But you know, gee, medium price is going up. Medium price is going up is not a result of the prices going up. It's a result of the differences in inventory on the lower end of the market versus the higher end of the market. Okay. Well, well you're. You're touching on that because that, I mean, and that's something that I know that we're going to go ahead and, and break down a little bit. But that, 
there has been some concern and there has been some talk. And I know that with uh, with everything that we follow, we have really had uh, – we spent some time educating people on how to read these numbers. Yes. Affordability. A lot of people are seeing things like that. They're seeing that the inventory is low when there's – the a shortage in inventory normally because there's more buyers than sellers. Then Supply and demand. The prices go up. So if the prices go up, then I'm not going to be able to afford the house. And if I'm not being able to afford the house because the prices are keep going up and up and up, there's a bubble and we're going to crash and 2008 happen all over again. And that's it. We're screwed. That's it. So house prices are going to drop seventy percent because they're going up. They're gonna they're gonna drop seventy percent, and we're all going to be out of business. Because that's what happened in two thousand eight. All right. Thank you very much, guys. There we go. We're done. No, See look, you in ten years. It, you know, man, this this market crash thing is is driving me nuts. So, man, I, I don't even know where to start. It's such a big topic. Cliff notes. Okay. The uh, equity. Equity is the answer, and nobody's talking about this, okay? Let's go back to 2005. Everybody owned multiple homes. Everybody bought homes they can't afford because the mortgage products were stupid. And uh, everybody was on a falsely deflated payment. And people don't remember how easily it was to get a loan. Everybody could qualify. Everybody got a mortgage, and everybody got multiple mortgages and yes. everybody got a mortgage with no money down. And so there was all of this that led to the market crashing. And uh, you got to keep in mind. But again, that- I'm sorry, but this is worth pausing there. What was happening in the mortgage industry and in housing led to the market crashing. Of course, of course. And there were two things. So one you know, one piece of it was, uh, and this is a whole big topic, but one piece of it had to do with birth rates and housing formations. Okay. And we'll get into more details when we do this whole episode, but going back and tracking birth rates 33 years ago, because that's the age of the average first time home buyer, uh, and then comparing that. So household formation. So children leave the house and get their own house. That's a household formation. Household formations and building starts is what you have to look at. The housing formations will closely follow the uh, population, the birth rates, right? So what was happening leading up to 2005 and 2008 was that birth rates 33 years prior to that had precipitously dropped. And uh, that happened at the same time that construction was going through the roof. So we had a reversal of things where we're having more homes being built than we needed. And then we had household formation dropping. So the market correction was going to happen, but then you sprinkle stupid mortgages on top, okay? And, you know, you get a mortgage, the payment's $1,400 a month on a house you can't afford. And then after two years, the mortgage payment goes to four grand. And by the way, you couldn't afford the $1,400 barely. Right. It's a stupid formula. And when you own multiple houses and you were in it with no money down, you just walked away. It was just logical. And then the other thing that happens, and this isn't talked about much, it became societally correct or okay. There was no stigma with foreclosures. Right. I remember going to a country club after playing around the golf back then, super wealthy country club, all these rich people around me, and they were all laughing and comparing how many houses they had in foreclosure. Whereas you go back before that, any sort of financial troubles, they would have hidden with their lives, a lot of them. Right. So that was then. Let's look at now. At least here in our part of the country, more than 50% of the houses are on free and clear. Yeah. Out of the homes that have mortgages, the average person sitting on 30% equity. My point is this. If you run into financial trouble in, the, in that type of equity position, you just sell the house. You just sell the house. The equity part, it's extremely, extremely it's, important. It's everything. Furthermore, the equity they have, they have it because they wrote a big fat check. Right. Furthermore, they have one house. Yeah. Okay. Let's add to the fact that it's a fixed rate mortgage. The old, I mean, when was the last time you wrote an adjustable? No, I mean, it's just just not a thing. You know, I do one or two a year, but it's just not a thing. And, oh, we should probably mention actually qualified for the loans to begin with. Most of them overqualified. for Overqualified. So, look, to say that what happened then is going to happen now is flat out wrong. And furthermore, if you go back 33 years ago from today, we're in the second year of a massive spike in, uh, in births in America. And especially with what happened with COVID, 
we are in a really depressed state of, of new houses being built. So the polar opposite of everything that happened back then is what we're dealing with now. And under no circumstances is the market going to crash with exceptions. New York, not looking so good. Right. Chicago, not looking so good. Some of the big cities that people are fleeing, there's a lot of problems in California right now, a lot of people leaving that state. Yeah. Um, so although there'll be people fleeing urban environments, which is a, a very real thing, as a whole, nationally, certainly in Florida, okay, which I think is a recipient. Certainly in Southwest Florida. Yeah. Um, I think it's a, it's a you know, Texas is, is benefiting, yes. the Carolinas are benefiting, Florida is benefiting. It's this entire pile of, of circumstances that is going to lead to a very, very, very strong market for three to four years. Oh, and by the way, interest rates are practically free. Yes, they are. So uh, no, the market's not going to crash. Now, when we do this episode, we're going to break down data. And more importantly, or maybe most importantly, we're going to give everybody the scripts and the the bullet points and talking points, because what's critical with this is that you not just say the right things, but you show and tell, okay? And the show piece is important because when you say things, it's a sales pitch. When you show things, it's fact. So we need to show facts. We need to educate. And uh, we're going to give all of the tips that we use on that. And we'll even post in the show notes our actual pieces that we use. And show a good comparison because when you look at what you were just saying, when you look at the state of not only housing, but also the state of the consumer back where the crash happened, the consumer, it's a more educated consumer nowadays. And overall, the economy by itself has, you know, we just recovered from the housing crisis. We learned that the economy needs housing to be strong. So third of the GDP. So again, it, it's. I, I think you said it beautifully. I think we're gonna we're gonna expand it on the next episode or on the episode that we talk about this, and we're gonna give people the tools, the tools that we use. We'll give them, um, you know, obviously we'll we'll put some links in the description and all that for them to see it. And once you show the consumer that, when you think about this. What the consumer is asking you when they want to buy a house or they want to sell the house, they're asking you for permission. They tell me, please, please give me a reason why I should do what I want to do because nobody wants to be stupid. Nobody wants to look stupid. Nobody wants to lose a lot of money. So there's this fear that's unfounded because once you ask the consumer, hey, why do you think that there's going to be a crash? They can come up with a reasonable or a research explanation on the why. It's just that's what they've been hearing all the time. I know my generation grew up with their parents living through the crash badly, getting hurt financially for generations to come. Devastating. So there's this fear of looking like an idiot. There's this fear of of being completely devastated. And it's very easy to not act when you're afraid like that. So- a lot of times the consumer is just asking for permission and being able to give them that permission with facts and reassuring them that this is a smart financial decision when they look at the alternative, which is renting and paying your landlord's mortgage. Well, they're going to be more eager at the time of making an offer. They're going to be more eager at the time of selling their house. So I think it's extremely important to be able to understand that and to be able to, like you say, not only for you to understand why there's not going to be a crash, but also to be able to present it eloquently in a way that the consumer can understand it. And, you know, after the conversation feels eager to go ahead and buy the house or sell that house. Yeah. And, you know, and hopefully all of the, the, the tips and details that we give on, on these episodes, hopefully the listeners are taking this back. You are taking this back and you are learning it and practicing it and rehearsing it and, and internalizing it because, you know, people always say scripts don't work and that's crap. Scripts work fine if they're your scripts and you've internalized them. If you take our scripts verbatim and try to use them, um, it probably won't work. If you don't internalize them, it'll sound terrible. But if you make them your own, like keep the important bullet points, keep the psychology in there, but really make them your own, the eloquence will come off. And that's where rapport and trust is built. And that's what it comes down to. And look, if you're a realtor out there, whether you're new or you've been doing this forever, 
and uh, you don't have the information to be confident enough that what you're doing out there, that the service that you're giving people right now, it's doing, it's a good service, that you're actually helping people when you sell them or help them purchase a house, that's going to come through. Of like course. that really will come through. I'm sorry. I don't care how good of an actor you are. It's a lot easier to sell a product that you believe in. And look, we're just telling you housing is a product that you should be believing in right now. Absolutely. And if your goal of the transaction is to get paid, that will come through and you will not be successful. And that's just the way it is. Um, now, you mentioned something before that people want to make the decision, but they got to feel comfortable doing it. They want permission to do it. That's true. But... It has to be a good financial decision, right? People see a house visually, fall in love with a house emotionally, but the ultimate decision to buy a house is a financial one, which brings up affordability. And you, you referenced it before, Ed, but, and, and this, when I watch the news, man, it pisses me off. It drives me nuts. Medium home prices up. Homes aren't affordable. This is a problem. And that's frankly bullshit. It's just not true. Yes, the medium home price is up. But like I mentioned earlier, it's an inventory issue. Okay. And what nobody talks about is you have to not only look at what's going on with prices, you also have to look at what's going on with wages. And affordability is literally in many parts of the country. Okay. There's, there's exceptions to everything. So if you're in Southern California and a one bedroom house costs $5 billion, move here. Fine. Yeah, move to Florida. <laughs> but um, affordability, by and large, for the overwhelming majority of the country and the overwhelming majority of people is actually not a problem. It's not harder today to be, to afford a home than it was back in the day. If anything, buying a house is very often cheaper. Well, the other thing that people are not talking about when they take all that into consideration, and, and look, I don't blame them. When you hear that the medium home price was whatever, $250,000 last year, and now is 20% up, then it's normal to conclude, if that's all the information you're given, it's normal to conclude, well, homes are unaffordable because I'm not making 20% more. But one thing that, and, and I know we'll, we'll break this down, is that at the end of the day, you don't have to come up with that 20% cash, right? And nobody's talking about the rates. The rates being this low, when you actually look at a 20% increase in price, which again, it's not the case, but even when you look in more, in a lot of cases, 20%, 10%, whatever it is, increase, when you look at because of the rates are so low now compared to a last year or two years ago, the actual payment of that house ends up being less than it was when the rates were up. And at the end of the day, I don't know about you, but when you buy a house, when you make that mortgage payment, what matters is... This, how much money is coming in versus how much money is going out? Look, when uh, there were a whole bunch of people I had pre-qualified in the 150 range, pre yeah. pre-COVID. Yeah. And, uh, I know where you're going with yeah, this. Buying a house for 150, I don't want to say impossible where we live, but man, it's really freaking tough. So all of a sudden, rates dropped. Okay. I put all, I told my team, pull everybody pre-qualified under 175, get them on the phone, get them in here. Let's talk. Okay. Not in here. Obviously it was virtual back then, but still zoom, zoom. <laughs> um, all of a sudden I'm like, Hey guys, guess what? Uh, what's your payment was on 150. You can now buy a house for 200 and it's less. The same payment. No less, less. So, but do I need to bring up the difference in cash? Of course not. Of course not. Your down payments a tiny bit more. Okay. Certainly less than first, less than security on rent. Right. And all of a sudden now people were able, people who were basically priced out of the market are now in the market because that move in interest rates, um, and I'm doing this almost as long as you're alive and these rates are stupid low. Um, it's a big thing. So we look at wage increase. We look at interest rates. Um, we look at tax situations. Like, like you said, the media will talk about one, what I consider a very flawed piece of data, which is median home price. Um, what they should look at is appreciation rates because that's more accurate. But they look at median home price. Yeah, because how many houses can you buy for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in this market? Exactly. But anyway, that's all people hear and that's all they know. So we're going to break that down for you, and then more. Uh, again, almost most more importantly, um, how what is the data you need to be able to to use your word it eloquently address this objection that people are having. And even more so, how much business are you going to get if you start putting some of these topics into videos yes. and posting them on social media? Because if you are not marketing on social media, as we always talk about, you are missing the boat. And this is the content that people want to follow. This is it. You got to educate them. Again, look, I'm a big believer that 
These are things that people want to do and you have to be able to give them permission by showing them how this makes the most financial sense for them. Absolutely. Without being afraid for the occasional person where it's actually not in their best interest, without being afraid to tell them, no, you know what? Maybe you shouldn't. You think you might lose your job? Bad time to buy a house. Your marriage yeah. on the rocks? Bad time to, have to buy a house. I, whatever. I mean, there, there's certainly exceptions, but as a rule of thumb, you're better off buying. And if you just say that, you sound like a person trying to get a check. But if you can understand their concerns and address them properly, show intel, facts, data, et cetera, all of a sudden now, um, the sky's the limit for your opportunities. Look, man, I'm so excited about this year. I'm excited about this year. I know that last year was tough for a lot of people. Yes. Because I know that, you know, we are, for those of you that are in the mortgage industry or the real estate industry or anything like that, are for those of you doing plexiglasses, I can't imagine how great it was. Good business. But a lot of people had a lot of hardship. Terrible. But look, this year, I'm excited about it. I'm excited that, um, you know, everything has changed when it comes to this. And, and, uh, I feel like there's a lot of opportunity, man. There's a lot of opportunity for new agents or for even agents that have been doing this for a long time to reinvent themselves. And now is the time to do it. Look, we've, uh, you know, when you and I met, we, we, I talked about the, the, the trials and tribulations, the ups and downs, the crashes and booms that I've lived through. And, uh, Folks, I promise you, one of two things will happen. You will capitalize on this opportunity or you will spend decades talking about how you wish you capitalized on this opportunity. Well, and let me let me touch on this real quick because I think it's important. Look, when we first met, you were kind enough to share with me a lot of the things that you did and a lot of the things, that, the ways that you presented things. And that allowed me to grow exponentially quicker than I would have if I didn't have that. And that's basically what we're doing here. We're presenting to everybody the way that we have learned to present things, the way have we have seen that presenting things work for people. And believe me, if you take some of these pieces of information and make them your own, you're gonna cut the time from now until you learning them by yourself. Absolutely. And how many people are in the business for decades and have never learned these things? Well, look, man, that's, uh, let's wrap this up. I, let's wrap it up. This is going to be great stuff. Everybody, tune in for these future episodes. We're going to break them down. We'll have some guests on. And if you take this stuff and you implement it, you're going to have a kick-ass year. And I, I believe that. So, hey, I'm Scott DiGregorio. And Gardo Ballantyne. And the question is, what are you doing today to be relevant tomorrow? Absolutely. All right, everybody. We'll see you on the next episode. Well, thank you guys for listening. And now it's your turn to implement everything you learned today. Look, you have a question. You have a topic for a future episode. Share with us. Yeah, tell us what you're doing. What are you doing today so you can be successful tomorrow? Send us an email at success at realestateoftomorrow.com. And don't forget to leave us a review, an honest review. Screw an honest review. Leave us a five-star review. And for every five-star review we get, we're going to send you a badass real estate meme t-shirt. <laughs> Those shirts are hilarious. See ya.